Welcome to the Heart and Soul Wellness Podcast, where we inspire women by teaching applicable skills and tools and assisting them with connecting with one another, healing, and aspiring to their highest selves so they can reach their full potential. Hi, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to be with you. And I'm so excited to have Alyssa on the show with us today. So today we're going to be talking about um, healing from domestic violence, but we're also going to be talking about how domestic violence affects so many women in our community. So the title of our podcast is The Art of Rising and Thriving After Domestic Violence. And This podcast also is for individuals who are in a relationship with an abusive partner. So we're going to be talking about some of the statistics and some of the things that you can do and how you can find support today. Okay, so I am so excited to introduce Alisa. She is a current graduate student at Boise State University and and has a social work service license in the state of Utah. She will be graduating with her master's in social work in December 2022. Elisa is originally from Northern California, where she received her bachelor's degree in sociology and Spanish from Sona State University. She moved to Utah in 2019 and began working for the Division of Child and Family Services as a caseworker for two years. Elisa is currently working at the YCC Family Crisis Center as the shelter manager and is an MSW intern therapist with Anson Family Counseling, providing therapeutic services to families involved with children with the child welfare system. Elisa has experience with working with marginalized populations, including migrant students, at-risk youth, and foster youth, children with disabilities, individuals who have experienced abuse, neglect, immigrants, and victims of domestic violence. In her free time, Elisa enjoys dancing hula, spending time with her friends, family, going to the gym, and taking her dog on adventures. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what brought you to the work that you're doing. So I was that nerd in school that just... um, in learning in history classes about just what was going on in our world. Um, I wondered why we didn't talk much about um, those marginalized populations. Um, You know, we learned about the Rwandan genocide, Japanese internment camps and things like that. And I just, I wanted to know more about why there was this power and control with a certain population. And so that's what brought me to sociology. I would have gotten my bachelor's in social work, but the school I went to didn't have that. Um, but I just have always had a passion for um, individuals who just didn't have the privilege that I I have had in my life, honestly. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, today we're going to be talking about survivors of domestic violence. And so I wondered if you could speak to, uh, first of all, the services that the YCC offers and what you guys are about. Yes. So YCC stands for Your Community Connection. It's kind of a long title, YCC Family Crisis Center. Um, We've been around for about 75 years. Um, And you can look at our website and watch the legacy video about how we um, came about. But we serve um, survivors of both sexual assault and domestic violence. And we've got several programs and different ways that we support these populations. Um, We have our shelter where we can bring in um, survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. We have 61 beds um, and I am the shelter manager over everything that happens in shelter. Um, We also have a sexual assault program where we can just um, help walk through um, the process with uh, survivors of sexual assault, go with them to exams and things like that, go to court with them and just help them through that. We also have therapy um, for 
um, survivors of sexual assault and domestic violence. And then we have an advocacy program where we'll go to court with um, with our clients and help them get a protective order. Um, and then if a client isn't eligible for shelter, um, because we do take the highest risk clients into shelter, these are individuals who are literally fleeing domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that someone who experiences psychological or emotional abuse, it doesn't mean that they're not experiencing um, domestic violence. It just means that we're taking in the higher, highest risk clients. So we do have a community case management program where we um, can still safety plan with those clients and um, help them find resources. And then we do have a small little housing program where we can transition our um, clients in shelter into that housing program where they can get their um, housing paid for for up to a year. We also are actually starting to open up a transitional housing project. We are tearing down our warehouse and our thrift store starting January, and we will be building a brand new apartment where we'll be able to transition um, our clients from shelter into transitional housing where they can still have intensive case management and um, kind of have a little bit of support learning how to be self-sufficient and on their own. So that's a little bit about us. We're really well known. People will come to our doors and ask us for things that we don't even provide. But the awesome thing is we know what resources and what providers in our community can provide that. I absolutely love that. Now, tell me if you have um, clients who are or someone who comes in that needs a place to stay, but they are dealing with like... Um, substance abuse issues as a result of domestic violence? Is that something that you work with or tell me a little bit about that? Absolutely. We um, are a trauma-informed um, agency recognizing that a lot of vic uh, victims and survivors of domestic violence have looked to substances as a way to cope with the, the um, abuse that they're, they have been experiencing for who knows how long. And so we recognize that. We obviously have rules and guidelines that we need to stand by in our shelter, but we also recognize that people use that as a coping skill. And so that's kind of our way of being trauma-informed in that way. Um, we need our clients we do need our clients to be in a place where they're ready to let go of that though and um so we really do serve clients who are ready to let go of those um those coping mechanisms that they've used and they're ready to focus on leaving their abusive situation now that doesn't mean we're not going to help a client whose primary um, issue in that moment is substance use, it might just mean referring them to where an agency can better serve them in that moment. And then when they're ready to come back, then um, we can support them. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, another question I have is I was wondering if you could speak to some of the statistics in Utah related to domestic violence and intimate partner violence as well. Yeah, so I think you said it earlier that one in three women experience um, domestic violence, and that can look very different for everyone or for, yeah, it can look very different for each individual. Domestic violence is so broad. It's not just physical violence. It's also verbal, financial, emotional, and psychological abuse. Um but I don't have exact numbers at hand right now, but yeah. I do know that, you know, with the pandemic and COVID-19, numbers really rose. Um, and especially as we were coming out of the pandemic, we, um, we saw numbers shoot really high and they haven't come down. They, they really haven't. They haven't come down. You're noticing that they're, they're pretty consistent. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
we're pretty consistent. You know, we're getting back to somewhat of a normal life and the numbers are pretty, they're, they're pretty consistent with where they shot up to after, after the pandemic. So that's really interesting to see. Um, but in the state of Utah, you know, looking at it from the perspective of we've got the LDS church that really drives our um, state and we've got um, substance use and opioid addiction that's really high here. And so it's just interesting to see how domestic violence plays a role in all of that and how it can kind of all overlap. Yeah, I was going to ask you what you thought some of those contributing factors could be where we're seeing such an increase. And I, my other question is, do you think the one in three is is accurate in terms of what's what's really happening? Or do you think that number could be higher? I think it could be higher. I really do. Um, because, again, like I said, verbal and psychological and emotional abuse is is just as serious as physical abuse. And I think we um, have had this idea that it's only physical abuse. And as we progress more in society and we learn more about mental health issues, um, I think that's part of why numbers are rising, because we're seeing that domestic violence is not just about physical violence. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I really do think that it could be higher if people spoke up more and, um, you know, felt empowered to speak up more. Not that, you know, not, not that they should feel ashamed not to, because obviously there's a lot we could talk about there where there's a lot of shame about why, um, individuals feel like they can't speak up and, and it's rightly so. And I also want to mention that we don't only serve women. Um, we also serve men um, or uh, gender non-conforming individuals because women are not the only people who can be survivors of domestic violence. We 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 know that men can also experience it. It's just that the statistics aren't there. Yeah. What percentage of men do you feel like you have that are coming into your shelter? It's very low. I, it's probably like 5%. It's very mm -hmm. low. Um, again, because, you know, we can talk about masculinity too, right? But, you know, what, how men were raised to not, um, say how they feel or ask for help. And so it's that much harder for them to ask, um, to seek support from us, but it's, it's very low, but we, we have had men in shelter and we have had transgendered individuals in shelter or, um, non-binary individuals, and it, it's very low. But we do want the community to know that we we're not a women's shelter. We serve all individuals. Yeah. Do you, are you aware of what the um, statistics are among um, LGBTQ and also men in terms of domestic violence? Um, it's actually really high for LGBTQ plus community. Um, considering right considering the statistics of what we have in with men and non-binary populations um i don't have an exact number again i didn't come prepared with that sorry no, you're okay um but it yeah we see a lot we we do see a lot of same-sex partnership and um a bit of mutual abuse that goes on in some in some of those relationships Okay. I th this is one of the reasons why I really feel strongly that we need a community of supportive individuals in our lives um, to help us with seeing through this clearly. In my previous podcast, I talked about the four levels of violence. And a lot of people are surprised that the first level of violence is in consideration. So this is when an individual starts to put their needs in front of yours. And then, of course, second, we have rejection. Third, we have sabotage. And then fourth is destruction. But it seems that we're only, we start to take action when it when we get to the destruction phase, when there's a physical um, manifestation of the things that have been building this entire time. So I wonder if you could talk to um, the cycle of abuse and what people can look for when they're in an abusive relationship to kind of see through some of this stuff. 
Yeah. Um, remind me what that first one was in in consideration. In consideration. Yeah. Um, I mean, with any relationship, right? There's all those TikTok videos and things about red flags, um, and we laugh about it, but but they really are, you know, what when you see it in the simplest ways of just not considering who you are as a person or as a human being, um, that's, that's a sign. Um, but yeah, the cycle of abuse, it's all about power and control. It's all about, it's all about one person wanting to control you, to control your life, to control everything that you do, um, and to have power over you. The, when you start, you know, and it, it creeps in, it creeps in, it really does. And this is not to say that survivors, I don't want to shame anyone for not, not seeing it from the beginning because it happens to all of us it, and it can, it can happen to everyone. Um, it doesn't matter the level of degree you have or how much money you make. It really can happen to anyone. Um, and so really when you start seeing that, oh, wait, I don't have a choice in this as simple as what I get to eat for dinner or um, if I can work at all or if I can have the phone. Um, those are the small, subtle signs of, you know, this is someone trying to control me. And why don't I have a say in in something that's part of my life? Um, yeah, those red flags, red flags, red flags really do really do help you. It's not to say that if someone has a red flag, oh, they're an abuser, but it's, you know, any relationship can turn into that. So. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and um, with the power of control, Will, um, we know that there's um, can be financial abuse. Um, also know that there is um, a minimization of behaviors, um, a denial of the abuse you know, the, a lot of the other ones that are on there, um, really speak to taking away someone's free will. And so financial control, um, threatening to use the children or using the children is one of the signs. A few of the other ones, um, that really stand out to me are, you know, gestures and actions that are, that are a way of demonstrating power and control that just like you said, over another person. Yeah, I so just pulled, I just pulled up the wheel because yeah. I was wanting to remember, but yeah, you named a lot of them. A big one is isolation too, mm -hmm. isolating you from your friends and family, people that you once, you know, enjoyed being around um, or even isolation from your hobbies and things that you loved doing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Losing losing that control over your own life, over your own choices. So when some, when you see uh, individuals come in and they're able to get help and they're able to stick with the program, what are some of the protective factors or what are some of the things that really help, um, really can help the community and individuals to really rise and thrive from domestic violence once they've made the decision to get out? Yeah, once they've made the decision to get out and to come here um, or to go to a friend or a family member, I think a big thing is, are those informal supports, mm -hmm. um, whether it's a mom or a dad or a good friend or a coworker. Sometimes mm -hmm. it, it is the church. Sometimes it is, you know, whatever religion they're in and their community. Having those supports is huge because, yes, we're YCC is a big part of, of, you know, getting them out of that cycle of abuse, but we can't do everything. It's, it's little things like transporting them to work if they fled from southern Utah to up here because they were afraid of their abuser finding them. Unfortunately, we can't, we just don't have the resources to drive them to and from work. Um, so having those informal supports, um, I see is, is really helpful, um, especially with families and, you know, moms who have kids and they need to go to work and they need someone to watch their kids. It's that friend or that coworker who's willing to watch their kids that, 
that really make or break their ability to transition out of shelter. Um, informal supports, I feel like, is a good one. What else? Just willingness and determination. Leaving, leaving is the hardest part, but it it gets harder. It really does, and um, and that's what we're here for. Anyone who comes into shelter is immediately assigned a case manager, and they'll meet with them weekly to take those baby steps towards self sufficiency, whatever that means for each individual. A lot of our clients come in without their vital documents. So they don't have a social security card. They don't have a birth certificate. They don't have a license. And we all know we need those things to find a job to get housing. Um, and so that's one of the first things we're doing with our clients. And so that willingness and that determination to keep moving forward is really, you know, I've seen some women come out of here just a, a totally different person. And we can't provide that for a client, unfortunately. We can help them. We can support them, empower them, give them all the support. But um, it's got to be that individual's decision to keep moving forward, to continue to leave that relationship. It's not a one-time thing. It can yeah. be hard. It's a continual um, process of yes. moving forward. And if you could um, speak to some of the success stories you've had of some of the women that were able to thrive after domestic violence and some of the things you've seen them do. Yeah, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just talking off of what's coming to my head. And so when you said that, I thought of this client who came in, um, just totally beat up. Um, Hair was just a mess and, you know, droopy eyes all the time, couldn't get out of bed um, for maybe the first month of being here. And by the end of her stay, which was about 90 days, um, she looked like a completely different woman. She went and got her hair done. Something as simple as that, going to the salon and getting your hair done. um, Survivors of domestic violence don't do that because they don't take care of themselves. They take care of their abuser. They do what their abuser wants. And so simply going to a salon and getting a haircut and getting it colored and brushing it and showering, um, that is huge. And, you know, she just walked out of here a completely different person. Physically, I could see it, but inside, I'm sure it was so much more. Um, Another example I can say is, you know, we have a lot of overlap with DCFS. Um, A lot of, you know, unfortunately, a lot of families do lose their kids because they have uh, been in this domestic violence situation and domestic violence in the presence of a child is an offense. And so that is a reason to remove kids. And so there's a lot of times we are helping families get their kids back from the system, working hard to drug test every day and showing that they have made efforts to go to parenting classes and things like that. Um, and so I think about a client who she was really, she was a really difficult client. And a lot of it was just her personality of, you know, she advocated for herself. A lot of our clients, because they're the ones who n- are never in control, they're very quiet, they're very timid. They'll do what you say. They, you know, they won't advocate for themselves because they've never learned how to do that or they were never allowed to do that. Well, this particular client really advocated for herself and, and I always told my staff, this is a strength of hers. This is a strength, even yeah. though, even though to us, it's like, oh, they're a difficult client, but th- it's a strength. Um, she got her kid back. Um, she got on our housing program where we'll pay for her housing for um, a year while she tries to find a- another housing program, such as Section 8. Um, and she found a place and she moved in and um, yeah it's, it's amazing. And we have a lot of success stories like that. Even in this crazy housing market right now, we're able to find, um, we're able to help our clients find something, even if it means moving in with a family member or finding their own place. So that's phenomenal. Um, let me ask another question. Do you have for individuals who are coming from, who are in the community that don't need, um, 
that don't need a shelter or a safe place to stay, but are dealing with emotional and psychological abuse. Do you have support groups for community members? Yeah. So we have a domestic violence um, educational group um, and it happens two weeks, two days a week. I'm sorry. Um, And one Monday nights at 6 p.m. on site in person, um, they can come to those classes and learn about um, the cycle of abuse. It's a 14 week class and you can join at any time. Um, And then on Thursdays at 1 p.m., we have a virtual one and it's on the same topic. So absolutely, we obviously get a lot of calls. We, We can't shelter everyone, unfortunately, but it doesn't invalidate that someone's still experiencing um, abuse. And so that's when we'll refer them to our case management program, where a case manager can talk to them on a, on the phone, mm-hmm. safety plan with them, invite them to our domestic violence classes, um, and just be in contact with them about, you know, how we can support them. We also have a sexual assault group um but that is a closed group i believe and um all of our groups it is something where you would just have to come contact us talk to us about what you're needing um and we we can enroll you in our services and then get you involved in our classes but yeah that's absolutely something that we can do do you know for the um domestic violence educational group do they do do they use the lundy bancroft why does he do that yes Okay. And I have in my bookshelf behind me, which you can't see because it's blurred out, I have a full shelf of the books because we give our clients that book all the time. And it's really something that a, a resource that we use. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if there's someone who wants to learn more and your groups are your groups are full, can they call and talk to one of the case managers and Absolutely. And get connected. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah, so. we've got a 24 hour crisis line and our, our um, crisis workers who are behind that phone, they have they have the phone numbers to transfer you to and the information to get to you. So absolutely. OK, and then a uh, couple more questions. So when somebody has chosen to leave, one of the things we've identified is support is critical um, resources. Um, getting into therapy is is also really important. Um, at Heart and Soul Wellness, we provide EMDR therapy, which helps clients with being able to move past trauma and really create a new life. But Lundy has a new book that I absolutely love. I don't know if you've read it, The Joyous Recovery. Have you I heard haven't. of it? Yeah. So he has he has a new book, and then he has um, the other book that I recently read was. Um, when mom, when dad hurts mom, helping children yeah. hold the wounds of, but the joyous recovery is like a brand new, like it's a newer one that he has. Okay. And it's really awesome. And one of the things I really appreciate that he says is to not look at yourself as broken, just looking at yourself as, as needing healing. Yeah. And so lastly, I really wanted to talk about this for a moment is how to help survivors with seeing their strengths and seeing themselves as a survivor instead of a victim, because we know the victim mentality can cause us to feel like we're broken, like my life is over. You know, we can go down that thought process and it can be very disempowering. So I wondered if you could speak to ways that survivors could be empowered through this process and how they could step into that. One of the things that I always say is, you know, if I talk to a client who came to our door, was literally fleeing domestic violence, like, I mean, running from the situation, running the streets from their abuser who maybe is threatening to kill them, um, and they come to our door, I always say, you know, I'm so glad you're here. It took a lot for you to even get here. Because if you talk to them more about their situation, um, they've probably been experiencing it for several months, for several years even. Um, And so the fact that they're even here and seeking help or they're even, you know, to those in the community and you have friends or 
people who come to you, the fact that they're even coming to you and talking to you, that's a strength. That's huge. And so that's something I constantly build on with our clients is you're here and you you had the strength to to get yourself up, to call, to pick up your phone and call. And that's huge in and of itself. Um, and so that's something that I build on. We definitely use strength based here. Um, I just sat down with a client last week who was really struggling with all these things she had to do. She's this smart woman and she's thinking so ahead at housing. And I'm like, you don't even have your ID yet. And so we need to take baby steps and that's okay. And um, really encouraging individuals to take baby steps to focus on themselves they've spent how long focusing on this other person who is controlling them well now it's time to focus on yourself and to make time for yourself whatever that means um and so a lot of the time we're not even addressing vital documents their first week here we're addressing okay get out of bed and that's a win or go walk to the kitchen and eat a meal to nourish yourself. And that's a win. Um, And so just recognizing those little things and the little choices that they're able to make um, now that they weren't able to make in the past, um, that's huge and that's empowering. And so to anyone who has a friend or a family member or, you know, someone who comes to you about a um, a situation like this, recognize those small wins because they really are they really are huge for a person who hasn't been able to make those decisions for themselves. Um, and they need that. They need that empowerment. They need that encouragement because they haven't been told the best things these last several weeks or however long it's been. And so if anyone can give them any encouragement, even if they don't want it, because they probably don't want it, um, I think that is, it's huge for them, even if they don't see it in the moment. Absolutely. So being able to encourage ourselves and lift each other up yes. as well as we're healing, which we all need anyways. Yes, we do. We all no. do. <laughs> and we no. all need support um, yes. for everybody. So. Yes, we need a tribe. And so I think this, I love what you said, that if we can just keep on moving forward and be so kind with the baby steps that we're taking right now, but I, but also for loved ones um, who are not in a domestic violence relationship to be patient, because sometimes that can be a challenge for family members. Yes, absolutely. A lot of our clients who come in here, they've burned bridges. Um, Part of case management too has been calling that sister or calling that mom who they've burned bridges with and and saying, you know, I'm so sorry and trying to heal those relationships because that's part of that's part of it. It's part of life and it's part of those social skills that we need. Um, but yeah, being patient, recognizing that there is literally nothing you can say and nothing you can do when a survivor is in the middle of the cycle of abuse, unfortunately. Um, but all you can do is support and be there for them with the healthy amount of boundaries, um, which I could talk a lot about, but we don't have time. I love that. <laughs> but I love um, that. Yep. Having healthy boundaries and being really supportive. And for anyone else who's interested in ways that they can do more to be an agent of change, is there anything that you would recommend so that we can start to address this issue that is a face that so many of our community members are facing? I would say find your local domestic violence shelter. I know for you guys out in Layton, it's Safe Harbor. Mm-hmm. For Weaver County, it's um, it's YCC. And, and, and there's a lot in the state of Utah. And um, if you're willing to volunteer, donate, see, see what the need is. There's often random things that we need, like towels <laughs> mm-hmm. for our clients. And, um, you know, if you're willing to in that way, but really just being aware, just being aware of this um, issue is, is, is enough. It really is because 
like I said earlier, this is a an issue that can affect literally anyone. Anyone. It doesn't matter what background you come from. It doesn't matter if you have a PhD. It doesn't matter if you make millions of dollars. Um, anyone can be a, a, a victim of domestic violence. And so I think just being aware of it and um, catching yourself when you're talking about these topics and not saying things like, well, why doesn't he just leave or why doesn't she just leave? It's not that easy. A lot of people are terrified to leave because it could be their life at stake. It could be one of the most dangerous things that they do. Um, their their abuser ha has probably said to them, if you leave them, then I'll hurt you or I'll kill you. And that's, it's a real thing that has, that happens to people. So just be aware, be aware of what you're saying and how you talk about these issues and be willing to listen and be willing to learn more. I love that. Lundy Bancroft is an awesome resource. If you want to learn more about it, he's incredible. And he has a website. I went through his blogs. He's just absolutely amazing. Um, with Christmas coming up, what are the volunteer opportunities and how can people donate or even volunteer if they're not able to donate? Yeah. So we do what's called spirit of giving. We're about to roll it out here in the second week of October, where we basically sit down and talk with all of our families about what their kids are wanting for Christmas. And that's including our um, kids in shelter, but also pe individuals we've worked with in the last year. And so we're going to be getting a hold of them and contacting them. Um, once we have those lists, we're also going to be finding um, donors. So people who are willing to go out and shop for these families will match you with families. We'll give you the list of things that they want. It'll be very specific, like size five pants or, uh, I don't know, I was going to say Polly Pocket, but that's not a thing anymore. <laughs> um, so it'll be very specific and so if you are interested in that, please get in touch with us. You can just call our number um, that you can find on our website. Um, we always have a needs list on our website. And again, with our transitional housing project coming up, that's a huge thing that we are raising money for. Um, so there's always, always opportunities to help out. And um, I, I get calls for it every day. And it's really encouraging to see our community stepping up. I love that. Thank you so much. It's been such an honor to get to know you and learn more about domestic violence and bring this awareness to the community. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Thank you for listening to the Heart and Soul Wellness podcast with your host, Sarah Carter. Make sure to like and subscribe. And if you have any thoughts about what we talked about today, leave a comment. Also, you can find us at heartandsoulwellness.org and on Facebook and Instagram. Join us again as we continue to help women heal, connect, and aspire to their true and authentic selves.